everyone and welcome to our panel. My name is Colleen Carroll and I'm a content publishing coordinator at Nexus Marketing and your moderator for today's panel. Today's panel topic is your nonprofit's virtual architecture, nonprofit web design innovation and best practices. And I'm really looking forward to this topic. I've already been speaking with our panelists. That there's so much to cover. It's going to be hard to fit it all in an hour, but we're going to do our best. Um, as usual, before I introduce our panelists and we jump into this fascinating topic, I do have some quick logistics to cover. NX Unite made in partnership with Nexus Marketing is a new online community resource for the mission-driven industry. The NX Unite mission is to make introductions that lead to lasting relationships and serves as a hub for connection in the mission-driven sector. As you saw in our video, on NX Unite, you can find upcoming industry events, suggested influencers to follow, trusted solutions, cause-driven podcasts, and of course, panels with experts such as these lovely folks here with me today. Today's hour-long panel will include time both for questions curated by my team and questions from you all, our lovely audience. At any time during the panel, please feel free to submit your questions via the questions tab. If you're having any technical difficulties or have any logistics questions, my team member Malou is under the username Team NX Unite and will do her best to assist. So let us know in the chat. Also quickly wanted to say this panel session is being recorded. So if you're watching live and after we get to the end of the session, you're like, I need to hear it again. So there was something I missed. Uh, you will get the replay in your email inbox automatically after the session ends. Give it five minutes or so and it should be there. Um, same thing for uh, if you have friends in the industry that you're like, oh, can't believe they missed it. Uh, Want to share it with them. It'll still be accessible on the NX Unite website in our on-demand webinars section. So feel free to continue to share that same registration page, they'll be able to sign up and access the recording. So never fear about that. All right, before I introduce our panelists, I do want to thank everyone attending live, attending uh, by watching the recording uh, a week from now, a month from now, a few months from now. It's really wonderful to be in touch with you, the Mission Driven community. For those of you who've already registered, I've gotten to take a sneak peek at the different organizations you represent, the different missions, um, which is just always very powerful. So thank you for taking time out of your day to spend it with us, and I hope this panel session is helpful helpful. All right. First, I'd like to introduce Anne Stefanik, is the co-founder and CEO of Canopy Studios. She helps create clarity around project needs and turns client conversations into actionable outcomes. As someone at the intersection of business development, marketing, and technology, Anne provides digital strategy to clients and organizations in the nonprofit, higher education, government, and corporate sectors. She enjoys helping clients identify their problems, translating it all into plain language, and then empowering the Canopy team to execute stunning website solutions that strengthen brands and help companies you succeed. Great to have you, Anne. Thanks for having me. Casey Crawford serves as Vice President of Digital Strategy at Pursuant. She brings a wealth of ex expertise in both nonprofit and agency strategy and leadership. Casey leads Pursuant's digital practice and serves as the senior strategist in partnership with client strategy teams to bring best-in-class digital offerings. With a breadth and depth of experience spanning over 20 years, Casey is dedicated to the ever-evolving digital transformation and true channel integration needed to drive meaningful constituent experiences, greater loyalty, and mission-focused growth for, for, for Pursuant's valued clients. Great to have you, Casey. Thank you. Great to be here. Carla Despardell is the design director at Constructive. She is a strategic designer who brings a decade of experience in cross-disciplinary design research, branding, and experience design for social impact. As design director, Carla sets constructive standards for design excellence and leads the design team to create powerful, purpose-driven brands that drive social innovation. So glad you could join us, Carla. Nice to be here. All right, we are going to jump right in, and Anne, I'm going to have you start us off. How does website design and or general virtual strategy for nonprofits differ from other sectors? Well, I think that a lot of sectors are looking for conversions, and you know, in this case, most of the nonprofits are looking for donations. So it is a bit different in how to tackle your design strategy. We find that the most effective way to build websites these days is just tell stories. And I feel like a lot of nonprofits have had a website for a long time, and it's often a bit brochureware where we're doing these things and this is about us. And we found the more successful ways to tackle nonprofit web design is through storytelling and kind of changing that narrative on your website. And sometimes people ask like, well, how do you storytell? What does that actually mean? And I think of that old hero's journey that many great stories take where there's a hero and there's a guide. And that's something that's really powerful if you can think of your different audiences, whether it is you're looking for donors or the end folks that you serve, is that they're ultimately 
the hero in the story and your nonprofit is the guide. So it's to you know showcase stories that how does um, somebody that you serve become successful in their world by either working with your organization or giving to your organization. Fantastic. Thank you so much for starting this off. Casey, I'm going to have you jump in here too. In comparison to other sectors, how does nonprofit web design and virtual strategies differ? So I would absolutely echo everything that Anne shared. I think audiences are a big um, differentiator, the reason why folks are coming to our site, who they are, um, what led them to our site. And I think also just even the purpose of a website for a nonprofit versus commercial. So thinking through, you know, again, to echo some of what Anne already shared, but um, just thinking about that, that difference, you know, our, our organizations are serving a lot of different constituents. So we have folks that are going to come to our website to learn more that are going to really dig into that story and understand what impact we're making in the world. That's going to be really important to them before they'll take that next step with us. Then we have other folks that might already be familiar with our organization, but they're looking about, you know, they're looking for how to go deeper. And so what are the opportunities for them, you know, whether they're already an existing donor or an advocate, or maybe they want to volunteer and give of their time. And so I think it really does come back to, you know, who are the folks that are coming to our website? What is the purpose of our website? Um, and I, I do think nonprofit websites just go deeper and do have a bigger opportunity to um, share impact. Definitely. All right, Carla, I'm excited to hear from you. What would you share with an organization uh, who's kind of just learning about this and how is web design world different for nonprofits? I completely agree with Anne and Stacey. I would say that I would divide it in kind of two columns, right? One is intent, is why the, the website was created to begin with. And, you know, it's very different from the other sectors, particularly the nonprofit sector, um, than, than, than sectors, for example, the for profit sector. It, it, the why is different, the intent is different, and, and just the general structure of how you build the website and the experience of it, it varies a lot. And I think um, to echo what what was already said, you know, a big differentiator in my experience is is audience groups. Um, audience groups for, for nonprofits actually are, are quite um, unique. They're very different. Sometimes they have conflicting needs, which is, a, which is an interesting thing to consider. Um, and, you know, ta tailoring to those needs um, within one website can become a really needy design challenge. Definitely, definitely. All right, a topic that comes up in almost every panel I, I moderate is just how busy our nonprofit professionals are. Um, so I was hoping to hear from each of our panelists kind of what are some small state changes nonprofits can make to their strategy or practices that could have a big impact without getting overwhelmed by a huge, massive project. So Casey, could I have you start us off with this one? Absolutely. Um, this question hits close to home, having been in the nonprofit seat for 17 years of my career. So um, it's very real. And I think one of the one of the you know, if it, it's a small change, but I think in some ways it can it can feel big. Um, one of the first things I would encourage folks to do is to take a different mindset towards website. We don't need to boil the ocean is an expression I like to use. Your website is never done. So if you're willing to kind of take a step back and say, OK, you know, even if you're undergoing a big website design or if you're launching a new strategy or you're really trying some new tactics, it's never done. Be willing to iterate, be willing to kind of lean into an evolving state of your website, be willing to like test and learn um, and just, you know, do things in phases. Again, you don't you don't want to put anything out there that you can't sustain. So that's one of the biggest things I would encourage folks to do is just make that mindset shift. Um, and then another one I think is, you know, when we get down to more of like the tactical things that folks can do, I think, you know, thinking through who, who is your primary audience? Are your service recipients more primary? Are your donors more primary? You know, Carla mentioned earlier, sometimes there's conflicting needs there, but just setting some priorities within what you're asking your website to do for your organization and for your constituents, lean into their needs first and make sure it's as easy as possible for them to do what you need them to do. Um, so if that's make a donation, make it easy, make it clear. Um, so optimize that pathway to get to that point so that there's the least amount of friction and just focus your energies on one thing at a time. Great, great advice, thank you. Okay, Carla, turning to you, what manageable changes can a nonprofit professional make today that could potentially make a big difference for them? Yeah, I really, I'm very aligned with this panel. <laughs> I really agree with Stacy, and I, and I would say it in a way that, you know, I often see in, in, in my clients and in my practice that there's a disconnect between um, kind of strategic goals and uh, the end end all design of the website, and that can you know that can be the architecture of the website or that can be the the brand visual design of the brand website. So we also um, we we try to uh, connect those two uh, 
world for clients, but there's a, a lot of tools out there that um, that folks can use. And I think one that we use in our in our practice a lot is creating design principles. So design principles are, you know, they're a distilled version of strategy um, in kind of easy to grasp, impactful um, strategic statements. So it's it's taking your strategy and taking a step back and saying what's the eight to the eight to ten more um, uh, as Casey was saying the, the the priorities the strategic priorities mm -hmm. that you have and once you have that list you know it comes it kind of becomes a, a sense checker um, for really every kind of design decision that you do down the line so that's that's kind of a practical way to link strategy and design. Great. Great. Okay, Anne, ready to hear your thoughts. Any advice on changes nonprofit professionals can make now that'll have a big long-term impact? Well, I would say that um, when it comes to web stuff, that's my that's my pure joy. And so often we'll have a client that comes to us with a slow website. One of the easiest ways that you can impact your conversions is to make sure your website loads quickly. You can go to Google page speed put in your URL and run a test and it'll give you a score. And the industry standard is usually 57 out of 100 or higher. So Google would rather you have your page load in three seconds or less, because if a page doesn't load within three seconds, that visitor will depart and they are not likely to come back. This also goes for mobile. So that's one of the easiest ways that you can increase conversions and make sure that your site is doing a great job for you is to increase the page speed. And so people ask me, how do I do that? Well, one of them is often looking at your images. People have an iPhone these days, they take beautiful large images and then they directly upload them to their website. And large images are usually a huge culprit of slow page speed. So that's a great way to just look at your how you're uploading your images. And if you're on, you know, a, a, whether it's WordPress or Weebly, they often have interfaces that will help it resize for the web. So performance is a number one lever that you can pull really quickly and that can immediately make a huge difference in how many conversions you get. Um, another great tactical way to like help people with their website is I always say, you know, like Casey said, tackle one problem at a time. As a nonprofit, I feel like there's so many hats on their heads, like they're falling off everywhere. And so if it is just saying, OK, this quarter and give yourself enough time, I think it's unrealistic to do a, you know one thing in one month because we are wearing so many different hats, but choose one problem to solve. So if the first one is making sure my website runs fast, you might need to change hosting providers. Sometimes if you're on like a shared hosting plan where it's kind of like everybody in the neighborhood is sharing that same piece of bandwidth, your site will run slow. So it may mean paying your hosting provider a little bit extra to get dedicated space. And that means when your neighbor has a bunch of traffic, your site doesn't run slowly and you have that dedicated space. I also find a great way to create um, impact without having to do a bunch of technical lift is looking at your content. So often people write content and then they kind of set it and forget it. And they forget that it is both good to look at it from an SEO standpoint, but also from like a conversion pathway standpoint. If a, whether it's a donor or an advocate or someone you're serving, they're gonna go through multiple series. I think there's a known marketing thing where you have to see a brand seven times for even to become aware of its existence. So there's different stages of content. So one of the things that we recommend doing with our nonprofits is listing your personas and then going through your content and cataloging it, which persona does it serve and which mind state does it serve? Because you have that first initial content, which is your awareness content, like, oh, I really want to volunteer to help out with the Humane Society. So then they Google and they say, where's my local Humane Society? And then the next one is once they become aware and they found you, then there's this consideration stage content where they're like, oh, well, I'm kind of in between two cities. Do I go there? Do I do here? Um, you know, I work. So when do I volunteer? Can I volunteer on the weekends? And it comes up with all these other questions that your content needs to serve. And then when they're actually engaged with you and they become a volunteer and then they can become both an advocate and both a donor, then there's another set of content that you need to create. And so often I see nonprofits with just that decision stage content.
and they forget that they actually need to kind of create SEO rich content at the very beginning and they need to create that consideration content. And that's a, something you can do without any technical support, right? You don't need a fancy web development team. You can just create a good old spreadsheet, export all of your pages and kind of do that mapping and you'll see some automatic gaps. And when you start writing that content, it will start filling that funnel a lot easier. Great. Thank you so much to unpack there. I feel like, again, the, the, load time on pages is such a crucial piece of advice. I think we've all been to a website where we click on it. It doesn't load. We're like, never mind. I don't need this. And we go on to the next thing. So, uh, but so much there. Thank you so much, Anne. Um, Carla, I'm going to have you start us off with this next question. How can nonprofit professionals keep up to date with web design best practices? It kind of seems like it's always changing and it seems like it might be a little difficult. So excited to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I think this is a really interesting question. I feel that there's a lot of, um, you know, really good design agencies out there that provide thought leadership uh, on, on, on several uh, um, kind of points. And, you know, an option is to subscribe to design agencies that you admire and that you respect and you look up to um, for their newsletter. Um, usually, you know, they, they put out kind of free, vast experience regarding a nonprofit website. Like I can say for us at Constructive, we, you know, we, we share, I think, monthly a range of best practices, curated resources, opinion articles, and you know they can range from subjects to accessibility and design and how to what what are practical ways of you um, testing your accessibility and design to you know what's technical debt and how to how to prepare for it when you're thinking about a, a redesign. So um, yeah, and I'm sure you know there's other peers in the sector that share these resources. So that's that's a way. Great, great. Okay, and any suggestions for how to stay informed on what's happening in the industry? Well, I think um, NX Unite is a great place to go, not to do a little plug, but that's a great, a great resource. I also, the um, N10 group is the nonprofit technology kind of group, and they have an annual conference, which is a great way to connect with peers. I also agree with Carla, like going and finding design agencies that you love and subscribing to their blogs they or their, you know, webinars. But there's also great ways that are just kind of like Smashing Magazine is a tried and tested web design magazine and they have a fantastic articles because sometimes web best practices do translate from industry to industry and they really break things down super easy to understand. <laughs> Um, I think those are kind of my main go-to resources other than just kind of asking my peers. I find like marketers are very peer-based. And so when you're like, I don't know what I'm doing here, you know, reaching out to friends, they often have a friend of a friend who have done that before. And you kind of create this community with just, you know, reaching out on LinkedIn or on email to your peers. And they often have some good recommendations too. Great. Appreciate the NX Unite shout out. I would also echo that. Please turn to NX Unite when you're looking for things. I think there's a lot there. All right, Casey, I would love to hear from you. Where do you suggest turning when you need more insight on what's happening within the industry? I echo everything that's already been shared by my wonderful fellow panelists here. And I would just kind of boost up the idea of there are a lot of communities out there that are so welcoming for folks working in this space. So, um, and I know you mentioned N10, you know, nonprofit tech for good. There's, there's a lot of different spaces where folks are wanting to teach and pass on knowledge and, you know, hard fought for knowledge in most cases. Um, so I think that's a great way. I also think keeping an eye on the commercial sector, and I know we kind of already alluded to that with the magazine, but I think, you know, in some spaces, there are certain sectors that tend to be a little bit ahead of us in the nonprofit space. So just keeping an eye on what even some of your favorite brands are doing, what do you admire about what they're doing with their website presence and how, you know, just understanding like what they're doing and trying to read behind the scenes of why they might have made certain decisions and then just seeing how that's translatable and applicable to the nonprofit sector. Um, yeah, I think I think that's that pretty much sums it up. Wonderful. All right. I want to encourage everyone who is watching live. If you have anything, topics that we haven't addressed, any questions you want to submit to our panelists, now would be a great time to submit them. I have a million questions. I could talk all day, but I want to make sure that uh, we're addressing them. So uh, please drop them in the chat, drop them in the questions tab, and we will do our best to address as many as possible. But before we move to that, I do have kind of one last question to sneak in. And Anne, I'm going to have you start us off on this one. What do you see as the future for nonprofit website design? How can nonprofit professionals prepare for said future? Oh, yes. 
Well, easy. <laughs> I think it always has to be easy. And with people being so overwhelmed with so many things, less is more. I see so many clients putting up big hero banners and just losing that space. Um, but I think that just website really has become the tip of the spear. And that's become so obvious during the pandemic. Our events all became virtual. And even though we're still opening up and we're going back to this new normal, there is this sense of the website is the tip of the spear. So it is figuring out all of your social campaigns. If you're running Facebook market, you know, you're running your Facebook ads and so forth, making sure that when they land on your website, they are appropriately channeled into the right section. So I think one of the best things that you can really think is about intentional design. So if you do, you know, have a Facebook ad running or you're doing TikToks or you're doing Instagram and you're kind of following all these cool social ways to connect with folks, don't just send them to your homepage. Send them to a curated landing page that doesn't have any navigation and only one ask. The less is more. I see so many nonprofits asking for five things on their landing page and it gets so overwhelming. This person just got there from TikTok. Like they're not really invested yet. So how do we get them to just sign up for the newsletter? And that's all you ask them to do versus sign up for the newsletter, donate, check out this page, just one thing. So I think as also as the web um, kind of technologies emerge. It'll also be tapping, tapping into kind of Gen Z and the younger audiences, which may mean offering different donation pathways, whether it's through cryptocurrencies, whether it's through donations through their work platform, and thinking about non-traditional ways to connect with diverse audiences. So lots to lots of stuff in the future to look forward to. But I think if it feels overwhelming, you just remember less is more. And what do I need to just do one thing at a time? Great. Absolutely. It is an exciting future, but I can agree that it might be a little overwhelming when you just look at it as a whole. All right, Casey, excited to hear from you. What are your thoughts on kind of the future of web design and how nonprofits can prepare? I, again, I agree with Anne. And the other thing I'd like to focus on, and I think some organizations are already doing this, but um, Carla, I think you alluded to the digital accessibility piece. Like we're no longer in a world where accessibility is a nice to have, it's a must have. Mm -hmm. And I think there is still a lot of opportunity for us to think about all the different types of folks that are coming to our websites and using our technology and making sure that we've considered everything from the reading level of how we're writing our content to the way we tag our images to the way that we use or don't use certain things on the website because of accessibility concerns, neurodiversity. You know, there's, accessibility doesn't mean what it used to anymore. And so I think really leaning into that space and making sure that we're focusing the right kind of energy. And I will say even investment into making sure that, you know, especially as mission-based organizations, we owe it to our constituency and our service recipients to have an accessible experience online. Um, and so I would really love to see organizations uh, focusing on that for the future, because that's not going anywhere. In fact, the needs are gonna continue to be greater for how our technology needs to serve everyone. Um, so really breaking down the barriers of access to our, to our websites. Um, I would also add on that I think, um, you know, again, I agree with everything that Anne said. I think um, just thinking about other, you know, what is the what is the impact and really thinking about different ways to tell impact, to show impact. Um, and I think just, you know, owning the story of your organization, I think the tendency would be as folks are prepping for the future, it's easy to get caught up in shiny new. It's easy to get caught up in, well, we have to be doing this, otherwise we're not relevant. And I think encouraging folks to come back to the basics, it is kind of in that same vein of less is more and also own your story own your organization's story and just really focus in on the impact that you're having and learn to tell that, learn to show that in other ways throughout your website. Absolutely. All right, Carla, your turn. What do you see as the future and how can we prepare? Yeah, I think this is a great question. I think that every year more design is, you know, created less in a vacuum and less with kind of just key decision makers and is brought more to the field and to the audience needs. So you know, um, kind of this term of human-centered design, which looks to keep the human um, in the center of the design process. And um, and I think every day more, I see it more as a standard of best, best practices, right? And I think like the good news from a nonprofit perspective is that usually nonprofits have a really good pulse in kind of the humans that 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 are within their sector. So I feel like they have kind of an upper hand <laughs> than, than other sectors. 
Um, and I think the reason why this is important is that when you under, understand your audiences pretty well and you test with your audiences and you dare to even co-create with your audiences, um, you know, it really helps you prioritize the brand's uh, engagement and the site engagement. So, you know, more engagement to your site increases the, the likelihood of more donations, more volunteers or users that can deliver your message um, uh, and can kind of uh, have more traction and more uh, scalability. So I feel that um, there, is, it, there is a really interesting um, uh, subject within, you know, human-centered design as a practice and also um, understanding how um, that facilitates engagement to your website. Certainly, certainly. All right, we're going to officially move over to our audience questions as well as some questions submitted during registration. So again, live audience, continue to submit them. Um, Carla, I'll have you start us off with this first question. It's a little bit long, so I'm happy to repeat it, but it's how do you guys effectively collect content from clients when building a new website? And how do you move forward when the client is always late on delivering the content to be inside of the updated branding, design, layout of the new website? That sounds like a familiar <laughs> everyday problem. Um, yeah, I feel that, you know, I feel how we tackle it in our practice is that we create a content matrix for, for our clients. Um, and it's, you know, it is a lot of kind of... Um, facilitating uh, just the structure and the ways that we do it. So you, we have a way that, um, I, don't, I don't like the term educate, but we, we, we have the, the client kind of learn how to, um, how to provide appropriate content. Um, we help them through kind of that process. So it's not, um, you know, we don't leave the client to, to just its own devices because it is a lot, it's daunting in, 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 in an aspect. It's, it's a lot of content. And as Anne was saying, you know, it's kind of this um, link between every user group and every kind of uh, appropriate content to it. So if you create one, like a proper structure that they can populate and two, kind of like help them navigate it, we've, we've, we've seen that that helps us. Definitely. Casey, any advice for people dealing with this issue? I think I'll just build on, you know, I think content inventories, content audits are incredibly helpful. It does help you make some of those tough priority decisions about, you know, kind of the start, stop, continue. You know, what content are we going to carry forward? What are we going to rewrite, repurpose, you know, all the things and where are the gaps and then prioritize that content. It just helps break it down for our clients in a way that, um, you know, again, not boiling the ocean. It, get, it, it makes it just more manageable over time. Um, and then just gives a guide, you know, during during that whole process. I think also bringing in the analytics piece of that too, because I think sometimes we're dealing with internal politics with regards to content on website, every team, every department wants their stake on content and being able to show how content is actually being consumed if it's existing or what content is missing and where that gap is and the impact that that's having on a particular constituent group can also be helpful in just deciding, you know, what content is actually needed versus what is being driven more by some of those um, internal politics, which we know are real. Definitely, definitely. And anything you'd like to add on this question? Well, again, I'll build on, on what these ladies have said, because I 100% agree. And it's for us, we start with helping them at first. So when we do key design layouts, we find that it's actually helpful if we help them write their key messages. And that's just like giving them some keys and giving them some strategy on how to write. And then once we've got a foundational, come some foundational content strategy pieces in, we can say, okay, this is going to be um, a page that's going to the, the purpose of this page is going to, you know, inform them of, you know, our mission, then we want to probably just have the mission statement or some powerful statement right at the top. So not a bunch of fancy images, and then they have to scroll. Because if you do watch on your website and employ some heat maps, you'll notice that most people don't scroll. So putting a big banner at the very top of your website is is missing space, like it's missed real estate. So for us, it's kind of building out what are the priority pages. And when we do wire framing, most clients have a hard time conceptualizing because they're used to working in like a Google Doc or a Word document. So when you're like, OK, we need these little snippets of content for them, their brain kind of goes, oh, how do I do this? So we sit down and we workshop with them 
Sometimes we use a tool called gather content. It's a great way for us as web designers to go and like make a, make a wireframe that's digital that they can actually go and click in a box and populate 150 characters. And they can actually see this one's 300 characters because it's kind of hard to conceptualize all these abstract pieces of content. So we use gather content or sometimes we'll use if that's, you know, too expensive, we'll use just a Google Doc that we as the agency have created these little buckets and say, here you're going to put 150 characters, uh, a powerful statement that is focused on um, something that the human needs to do. And then we'll usually sit down week by week and coach them. Uh, we tell our clients that if they haven't started content by the sign, the time we've signed our contract, we're already behind. We think, oh, oh my goodness. But it is one of those things that as we're going through um, the content work together, it's sitting down with them week by week, day by day, and kind of checking in on them. I know that so often things can get delayed because either they feel overwhelmed, it's not their day job, and we do find kind of sitting down week by week and hand holding helps them gain that momentum and gives them small bites. Back in the day, we used to say, okay, we're now at week 12. We now need all your content and the client would stall. So we do want to start even as we're starting the very early phases. And we use a KFC model, which is yes, that's also fried chicken, but it's a uh, keep, fix or create. So do we need to keep this piece of content? Mm -hmm. Do we need to fix this piece of content? Or do we need to create that piece of content? And we start with some easy bites and just get that momentum. And that often really helps. And worse comes to worse, if the client's really slow, we kind of say, we have the saying is like, we like to match and meet pace, which means if you're falling behind, we're going to grab your hand and we're going to hold you. We're going to get through that finish line, which sometimes just means allocating a little bit more budget to actually copywriting from some external support. All right. Uh, we had a question come in with registration that Casey, I'm going to have you start us off with, which is stakeholders often do not understand the design process and hierarchy. What do you do then? How do you handle that? Great question. Very real. I have experienced it in every nonprofit seat I've ever sat in, so I appreciate the question so much. Um, I think one of the best things to do is to engage them early and often um, and just really, you know, I, I think understanding there's different levels of stakeholders too, right? So you have, you know, everything from, you know, for organizations that need to report out to their board to senior leadership. I think first of all, just identifying who are your different stakeholder groups and then determining which decisions do they actually need to be a part of versus which decisions can be more of, we've made this decision, here's the reason why, you know, more of a decide and announce type situation. Um, so I would say first identify who your stakeholders are. Um, I have had a lot of success in the past with um, doing actual stakeholder trainings and engagements earlier on, giving them an overview, making them feel like they're getting a sneak peek on whatever, you know, website endeavor you're, you're working on. Um, and then again, I think just having a communications plan specifically for stakeholders that is written at the level of less is more, you know, just the just the details that are most relevant to where they sit in their stakeholder seat. Um, you will always have folks who want to be more involved and who think that they should be making decisions about all the things. But I think, you know, just in a in a in a respectful way, just I think the more you engage them early, it, it prevents further challenges down the line because a lot of the questions we get from stakeholders are because they feel like they weren't informed. They were left out of a crucial decision. They don't understand the purpose of the project. You know, all of those things become derailers later on. So the earlier that we can engage them, um, you know, and again, I think that comms plan specifically for stakeholders is crucial. Definitely. Carla, anything you wanna add about handling stakeholders who might not fully understand the design process? Yeah, I totally agree with, with Stacy. Um, you know, identifying who these decision makers or kind of leaders of every stage um, are is really, really important. Um, you know, and giving them and being uh, transparent about it, the fact that they have the agency um, to, to make these decisions at the, and that the organization that they're working for supports that. Um, but also, like, we think a lot about what does those, what those, those leaders need from us, right? How are ways that we can create um, either talking point to, uh, talking points to explain, for example, a new kind of logo refresh and the rationale for it, or um, you know what what can we facilitate so they can bring back to the team and gather their necessary feedback or their necessary approval. Um, and then another thing I feel is really really important, and you know it's still it's still it still works virtually, <laughs> is doing workshops. It's getting everybody in the same room um, and kind of giving giving people more 
kind of more when it comes to design. Design, I think, um, in its essence, should be fun. Like, it can be very serious and it can be very important, but it should be fun and it should be kind of a, a playful activity. So kind of um, creating those environments where different types of uh, personalities and even levels of the organization can come and, you know, facilitate it in a way that everybody has an equal say and equal voice. Um, it's it's really astonishing how um, different things kind of, you know, come from those workshops um, and, and it really kind of trickle down to the organization in other ways as well, in unexpected ways. Definitely. And anything you want to add on stakeholders? I think we're all cut from the same cloth. I think these are exactly <laughs> early and often. I have this very technical term called avoiding the swoop and poop, which is that highly engaged, very intelligent stakeholder that doesn't pay attention till the 11th hour and then dive bombs in. So we want to find those swoop and poopers and we want to have a chat with them. We also find data speaks a million words. So there's a free tool out there called Hotjar and you can pop it on your site and it'll look at heat mapping and it'll show you where people are scrolling and where they're clicking. And you can also add a very quick pop-up survey. So you can say, what did you come to the website for? And that little one question often leads into a ton of data. Another great way to gather data is look at your search, Google Search Console. What are people on, if you don't already have a search on your website, I would encourage you to put a search on your website and then turn Google Search Console because people that come to search on your website are 80% more likely to convert because they're coming with intention. So if you find out what people are searching, it often leads to clues on what kind of content you want to put where. And when you look at those heat maps, and that's really just like you can see where people are scrolling, you'll be shocked that it's the true. It's like most people are not scrolling below the fold. So how do you put your most important content at the top? And I say these little data nuggets because it's easy, it's accessible, it's affordable, and you can do this mostly on your own. And then what you can do is when you take those stakeholders and you do those intakes, we're big fans of setting a North Star or a goal for the project. The executives don't care about what donation tool, well, maybe they care, but they're not in myriad in the details of it. They want to know that if the North Star for this project or this activity is going to be, you know, increasing visibility of our mission throughout this new sector, we're going to go after this new audience, then that's your North Star. So when those potential and you get everybody on the same page, you've done all that data, then you do a short presentation to those stakeholders so they can see this is the strategy, this is the North Star, this is the data that supports those decisions. So they are less likely to come back three quarters of the way to the project and say, oh, well, why am I not getting my thing I asked for? And it's like, well, because your thing wasn't actually a priority for the users and it's you as the stakeholder, it's not necessarily about what the stakeholders want, it's about what the user wants. And often that's a very, you know, it can be a bit prickly. So I do find that leveraging even a little bit of data goes a long way. And Colleen, if I can add one other thing, I also Absolutely. feel like going back to this idea of design principles and this practice, I feel that it's quite, it's quite useful to have the client group or, you know, the nonprofit um, decision makers kind of agree on these um, distilled uh you know, pieces of strategy. So they, they check off on it and they're like, yeah, that makes sense. That's what the brand needs to be. And then, you know, sometimes um, design is, is looked at very uh, uh, subjective, but if you can trace down kind of that strategic line and say like, remember these design principles, like, is this reflected? Um, I think it gives folks that have, uh, that are much more kind of rationally based um, something to kind of, um, you know, chew. Um, other people, you know, get excited about exciting designs and kind of get it in, in the moment. But but to to what Anne and Stacy were talking about, like it is our responsibility to kind of facilitate the client through the process and mm -hmm. and to kind of and think about the different stakeholders and the different needs in terms of, you know, personality and or priority within the role that that that, that can that can tell. Definitely. We've had a number of really fantastic questions come in, so I'm really looking forward to these. Carla, I'll have you start us off with this next one. For those just starting a nonprofit website or looking for a designer, what types of questions should they ask and what should they look for in order to find a reliable support team to work with? That's a great question. I feel, um, I think that 
the first thing is experience and portfolio. Mm -hmm. Like I think as a design director, that's what I kind of go for. Like where, um, what's the evidence trail or like past projects where you've been successful and where you've gotten it right. Um, and kind of understanding um, how they've, again, linked these strategic goals that the organization has um, to these kind of, a, you know, designs. I feel a bridging that gap between strategy and design is so important. Um, and I think, I feel like, I think um, at least the way that I, my work philosophy is that, you know, I like to work with people that are aligned with the values um, of, of my organization and, and, and my, me as an individual. So, you know, kind of asking the designer regarding um, uh, his opinion or, or, or the value that your mission has for them and like ha getting that good kind of um, a cultural fit, I think is, is, is an also an important part. Definitely. Definitely. And anything you want to add to that about finding the correct team for your work? I know we are always looking for good design talent and we like them too. We have actually three different types. We have the content strategist, the user experience strategist, and the visual designer. It's hard to find a unicorn that can do all three. So it's kind of figuring out what is your design problem? Do you need help with kind of your content strategy and actually positioning your organization? Or do you really need to think thoughtfully about that user experience? Or are you looking for that facelift? You feel like you've got the strategy done and you need to just tackle the visual design. One of the things that we look, at, look for is having people step through their process with us. Take us through, you know, how do you go from, you know, engaging a client all the way to launch? Because we also encourage the designers to work with the development team to make sure the design is realized. And one of the things, it's a big investment. So we do what's called a mini project. We actually pay the designer eight hours to do something small design this, you know, create, take these two mood boards and create a visual design layout. And that really is, that's where the proof is, is we find like anybody can interview really well, but when push comes to shove, can they produce? And that's what we do. It's paid. And we find that was a really tactical way to really test a designer before spending a bunch of money. Because like, you know, Carla said, the values being in alignment is super important for us and just showing their ability to communicate with clarity. That's one of our core values is clarity. So if they can't present their visual design to us in that mini project, we know they're going to be a disaster bomb when it comes to working with clients. So people can interview really well, but but can they do the work? So if you have the capacity to do a paid mini project, that's a great way to test the waters before jumping full again. Definitely. Casey, anything you'd like to add? Otherwise, I can get the next question to you. The only other thing I would say is I think that on both sides of the design process, folks hold things dear. And so I think getting into that process and just understanding what exactly you're looking for in a partner and just being real and honest about just where you are as an organization and what type of person it's going to take to kind of work through this process with you, because it's hard to let things go. And I think especially folks that have been at organizations for a long time or are really immersed in the mission, you know, we at nonprofits, we really go deep in our missions. And so we, we hold that very, very closely. And it, there's a vulnerability involved in letting that go and trusting someone else to bring that to life visually. And so I think just being honest about where you are with that and having that be a part of your vetting process when you're seeking out a partner who gets that and who you can trust with that, you know, with that exchange of this thing that you hold so dear. Definitely. All right, this next question, Casey, I'll have you start us off. It's going back to accessibility, which I know is a topic you brought up. Um, the question is, most people focus on pretty pictures rather than the architecture. What are your thoughts on mega menus versus drop downs or flyouts for site navigation? I'd also just generally love to hear your thoughts on how our nonprofits today can improve their accessibility. There's a lot in that question. Um, I have thoughts, you know, I'm always going to come back, you know, when it comes to accessibility, I always believe in um, in testing and just getting familiar with what, you know, there's so many layers of accessibility. So thinking about, again, you're not gonna solve all your accessibility problems in one fell swoop. You're gonna have to prioritize. And I would prioritize based on who your current constituents are and who your service recipients are and what their needs are. So if you know that a, 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 a high volume of folks are using adaptive technology to access your website, then we better be sure that our text is readable, that our images have tags. So it becomes less about 
um, you know, some of the tactics than it does about like really understanding like where you currently are and how you're going to prioritize that. Um, there are ways to to still use, you know, attractive <laughs> design and attractive tactics that can still be accessible. But I think, you know, again, less is more. Um, and really understanding just where your organization is and the commitment that your organization is willing to make long term in accessibility. So, um, you know, I could go on and on for that. I think that's a whole separate topic. We could get into accessibility, but there are, um, you know, there are organizations out there that can serve as a resource for you. There are web content accessibility guidelines ranked from different levels of compliance that I think are really helpful for an organization looking to see where they are with accessibility. And even, you know, it go, that, that, uh, organization will help you as you're making those tough decisions when it comes to design um, about what might be accessible, what not, what might not be, and then always test. I mean, I'm a big believer in having adaptive, adaptive technology on hand to test mm -hmm. in a real life situation and not just assume, um, you know, that just by following the practice that it's going to work. We always, we always test with real adaptive technology. So I know that's a short answer. Um, you know, it depends because again, we're, we're, accessibility is huge. There are people with, you know, vision impairment, neurodiversity, um, you know, audio impair, you know, the, there's a wide spectrum. And so again, knowing who your constituency is and, and starting there um, and then prioritizing from there, what are the most important, uh, important aspects of accessibility that you wanna tackle first? Definitely. Carla, anything you'd like to add on accessibility? I completely agree. I don't think I have much to add. I think just the message that uh, Casey was saying about, you know, there's a lot in that world. So prioritizing, understanding your audience groups and their needs. Um, so it's it's something about, you know, prioritizing and, and knowing how far you want to get into it. And then the other thing is, you know, where do you really have to get into it more? So I think like targeting those two things is a good way to start. Definitely. And anything you want to add for accessibility? Otherwise, I'll get you started with our next question. Very quickly, there's technical accessibility. So making sure if you do use mega menus or drop downs or fly out bars, as long as they can be accessible via keyboard. And you can test all of this. There's a lot of great free plugins that we can share in the show notes after of ways to test your accessibility. Often you need a developer to help you fix those things. Um, and then the other one I just like to note is the inclusivity side of things that if you're tackling new markets, you want to look at your images, you want to like make sure your forms when they're asking for if you have to ask for a gender that you include all the different variations. It's not just him or her. Same with marital status. You don't want to just say single or married. There's that's just too binary and it's not inclusive. And you want to think about, you know, different ways to create more inclusive content with making sure that you're using the appropriate language and imagery. So, like I said, it's a very long, uh, there's lots of different ways to tackle that. And I think the big one is, you know, just, just if you're on it, like in Macintosh, for example, turn on your screen reader and go to Google and try to navigate, go to your website. Believe it or not, Starbucks does one of the best jobs for accessibility. So if you turn on your screen reader and go to Starbucks, you'll be like, wow, this is so easy to navigate. And that's like one of the best in class websites. I know that's a funny one to use as an example, but they serve everybody and they made sure accessibility was a huge priority. Great. Um, and with this next question, uh, it's what are your thoughts on using plugins like Google API for, for auto translation of web pages? Yeah, so Google is deprecating Google Translate. It is no longer going to become available. Uh, translation services are going to be available within your browser. So that is going to auto translate and that will be available. If you want to actually do translations correctly, there's two different ways to do it. One, that you can create a multilingual website and have that little flag and, and flip through the different languages. And either you have to pay a content writer to properly translate it, or you can pay some big bucks and use a auto translation service that actually sends content. Lingo Tech is a company that we rely on because they're real humans that translate that content. So it is kind of that crawl, walk, run when we talk about translation, because the crawl factor is going to be built into every single web page. 
So if you are using Google Translate now, it will be deprecated if it's not already gone, and you, the browser will actually do the work automatically. You may notice that if you hit a website that's in Spanish and you're an English speaker, it will say, would you like to translate this site into English or vice versa? So you'll just want to be mindful that um, some of your words may change into weird words when Google does its job. So if you are really caring about an international audience and serving different populations that have different language needs, it may be time to actually invest in an actual translation service to do the right job and not send interesting words back to audiences. Definitely. Uh, Carla and Casey, anything you want to add? Again, we have one more question I want to do, and I know we're almost at time. Awesome. All right, uh, I'm gonna officially kind of wrap up our audience question time. Thank you to everyone who submitted. If we did not get to your question or you still have any lingering ones, uh, never fear, we have a survey going out after this panel. It'll be automatically in your email with that replay. Uh, please fill out the survey. Let us know we're gonna continue to plan panels. We're already starting to look at January and February of 2023, which is very hard to imagine. Uh, so let us know so we can address them in future panels. Um, my final question that I wanna hear from all of our panelists uh, is kind of a broad one, um, but I feel like a great one to end on. So today we really focused on web design, but obviously there's so many topics related to nonprofits and even within web design that we could spend entire hours on. So I'd love to hear from our panelists, what conversations do you hope nonprofits continue to have in the coming weeks and months? So fairly open, but excited to hear your thoughts. Casey, can I start you off with this one? Sure, I'm actually gonna give two answers. Um, so my one will, of course, be digital accessibility. Um, I'm a huge champion and passionate about digital accessibility. I think it's, you know, again, not not optional. It's a, it's a table stakes in this uh, world that we're living in. The other one is I really want nonprofits to continue the omni-channel conversation. You know, we're talking today about website, but I think if we've learned anything in the pandemic, it's that um, folks really want to be able to engage with our organizations in whatever channel they want, whenever they want. And so making sure that we're not just working in channels in silo from each other. So how is our website also boosting up and benefiting from all of the other channels that we're engaging with our constituents and our prospective constituents with? Um, so I'm really excited. Organizations are already tackling that in some pretty impressive ways. And I hope that that continues. Definitely. All right, Carla, what conversations do we need to have in the next few weeks and months? Well, I think... Um... It's interesting because Anne alluded to this in one of her answers. Um, you know, I think a lot about ethical storytelling in, in my everyday work. Um, and, you know, in my case, I'm interested in the representation of kind of powerful and valuable stories through images, right? I think that there's a lot to be said in storytelling when it's, it's kind of con written content related. I think less so when we're creating you know, um, kind of in, in visual representations and a lot of nonprofits tackle um, quite sensitive, uh, you know, subjects and realities of, of humanity. So, you know, what what um, what I'm interesting, interested in having a dialogue of, you know, what, what are the principles of correct or good ethical storytelling through images and what common learnings can we extract from kind of lived experiences that, you know, um, nonprofits have to have a, a lot of. Definitely, definitely. All right, Anne, what conversations do we ha need to have the next few weeks and months? I echo, I echo all of that. I feel like building a diverse web is, is so important in an accessible web. And the storytelling element is something that I'm so passionate about because I've seen it transform organizations from we're doing this thing this is what we're doing, this is how you can get involved, to switching that story so that the users really feel engaged. I'm gonna show a book that I'd encourage every nonprofit to read. It's called Building a Story Brand by Donna Miller. And it goes through that very similar arc of that, you know, Luke Skywalker would be nothing without Obi-Wan Kenobi, right? He found his guy to make him the ultimate Jedi. And it is something, whether it is your service constituents or your donors, is they want to feel like the hero. So how can we tell stories that's not just somewhere on our blog? How do we create this like experience? And that's what I'm really excited if nonprofits, you know, take that back today and say, OK, right, my site is actually very brochureware. It's all about us all about us how do we flip that table around and start telling those meaningful thoughtful stories so people can really see themselves as a hero and part of that journey 
And we see that time and time again is your is your advocates that are out there, people that have you know experienced benefit from the services you provide, they're willing to share their stories. So capturing that with little video snippets, capturing that with little testimonials that you can put on your site is a great easy way to start. And I'd love to see more nonprofits really digging into that storytelling and um, figuring out a way how to, you know, really engage with their audiences because it's about the users. As much as the organization, you know, the stakeholders got this big say in everything and maybe putting down the money, it's the users that we're trying to create impact. Absolutely. All right. With that, we've reached the end of our panel. I want to give a big thank you to our panelists. I know if we were in person, there would be a round of applause. But since we aren't, just know that I'm sending that to you in our virtual sense. I also want to give a big thank you to everyone who attended live, watching the recording again. Um, I hope you enjoyed your health self. I hope you learned something, uh, take something with you, kind of change what you're doing for the better. Um, but thank you so much for spending time with us. We have a packed fall of panels going into the winter. So please keep an eye out on the NX Unite website as well as the NX Unite LinkedIn. Uh, you can even find me on LinkedIn and I'll keep you informed on it. We have panels on communication strategies, fundraising approach, involving tech within your technology and so much uh, within your nonprofit. There we go. Um, and so much more. So just keep an eye out. I'm sure there will be some panel that addresses some topic that you would like to learn more about. Um, the registration for all October panels is already open, so feel free to sign up. You'll get a nice little email reminder when they happen. As I mentioned earlier, we are sending out that survey that has an opportunity for you include, to include any questions or topics that you would like to have featured on future panels, as well as to provide general feedback on your panel experience. With so many panels this fall, we want to make sure we're continuing to improve our practices, so please let us know how we can do so. We want to hear from you. All right. I think that's it for me. So we'll end a few minutes early, but thank you so much again to our panelists. I had a fabulous time. I hope everyone has a nice rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone.